Hi, my name's Ollie, and in this Politics Explained video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know about devolution in A-level politics. So that's not just all the knowledge you need to know, but also the key arguments and debates and essay questions you could be asked, and the key arguments on either side of those debates, giving you some real help with the analysis and the evaluation. So in terms of the different sections of this video, because it's going to be a pretty long video, I'm going to start by going through the kind of sections of the specification this covers and some past essay questions and like the key debates that it's going to, it's going to address or that can come up in, um, in the possible exam. Then I'm going to quickly introduce why and when devolution was introduced. From there, I'm going to go through how power is devolved in each country. So in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, with England obviously being um, quite a bit different. Um, from there, I'm going to go into some kind of key debates on devolution and some overall notes as well, as well as giving you some really good examples for a policy difference and kind of increasing tension, as well as COVID is a really good recent example um, and recent um, bit of knowledge for how devolution has changed. Um, and then finally, from there, we're going to look at some other debates over devolution. So that's going to be A, on the impact of devolution, um, on firstly on democracy, then on the unity of the UK, um, and also on economic and policy, um, economics and policy impacts. And then finally, going to look at potential further reforms to devolution. So this is on the kind of um, debates about re further reform part. And that's looking at, should there be further devolution to existing devolved bodies? Should there be an English parliament? Should there be regional assemblies? That kind of thing. And then at the end, we're going to circle back um, to some of the key essay questions and the, some source questions that have come up, just kind of recap um, and recap what you need to know for the exam. Um, so the PDF, which you should be seeing up there, and we'll have all the notes um, for this video, you can find in the first link in the description to um, on the Politics Explained website, where you can also find a link um, to any tutoring if you're interested, um, as well as a lot of free and paid resources such as essay plans, essays, um, and kind of other resources that are on there to help you with their politics A level. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. So first off, looking at the kind of parts of the specification this covers. So this is a pretty long um, video and a pretty long lesson um, because it really covers a lot of content. So the key thing it covers is devolution, right? And that's in the constitution topic of the UK government, the, the first part of the UK government topic. That's devolution to... Um, all bodies in the UK, so to devolution in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, um, as well as kind of how there's been further devolution in, in the last decade, effectively. And then finally, the debates over whether de devolution should be extended further in England. And also, I think there's some debates about whether it should be excluded, kind of whether it should be um, extended further in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well, because I think that's quite important to consider as well. In terms of potential um, essay questions and kind of key debates that can come up, um, the first, there's kind of two key types. So the first one's going to be on the impact of devolution in the UK, um, so far and whether it's been a success. So you could have a, something such as, um, to what extent has devolution, should devolution be seen as a success or a bit more complicated one, um, such as evaluate the view that devolution has been good for Wales and Scotland, but not for England and Northern Ireland. So that's really looking at the success of devolution. And the second one you're going to get is in, in relation to further reforms. So that's one such as evaluate the view that devolution um, reforms haven't gone far enough. And that could also be more specific just to England. So evaluate the view that there should be further devolution reforms to England or evaluate the view that there should be an English parliament. So there's the two types of questions. They're the ones you're going to be one to practicing and possibly um, making essay plans for. There will be essay plans um, before the final exam on the Politics Explained website, which you can purchase, but also can be useful um, to make yourself. So yeah, they're the kind of key questions you can get asked. Um, and it's also quite likely to come up in a source question because it is a very difficult topic and one that a lot of students are probably going to go into the exam in with not that much information. It is maybe more likely to go and come up in a source question as well. So starting off, how, when and why was devolution introduced? So how and when was devolution introduced? So it's in, in, um, included in Labour's 1997 election manifesto. Um, and after Labour's kind of landslide victory in that election, referendums are held in each of the proposed devolved bodies um, on whether those kind of devolved bodies, the population of those devolved bodies, wanted devolution. And it was voted yes in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, it was kind of part of the Good Friday Agreement, um, which really brought an end to the violence of the Troubles. Um, but in that was kind of met, uh, mechanisms for devolution as well. Um, and then Parliament passed Acts, um, which kind of set up the devolved bodies. Why was it introduced is a bit more complicated. Um, 
it was partly to provide an expression for nationalism, especially within Scotland, which obviously, um, if you know about the Scottish independence referendum, has a significant nationalist movement, um, to silence calls for independence, which are, of course, coming um, from Scotland at that time, um, and also just to satisfy the calls for greater autonomy and, and democracy, even if they were from some people who didn't even want independence. Some people just wanted greater autonomy and greater local democracy in the UK. And then it was also part of um, New Labour's wider constitutional reform programme of modernising and democratising Britain. Um, not, and it wasn't just in terms of kind of silencing calls for independence and delivering uh, more democracy. It was also hoped that it would result in improved public services and economic conditions. So now we're going to go into um, each country in detail, kind of first with Scotland, then um, then I think Wales, then Northern Ireland, then England, for kind of looking at how devolution developed in them, um, the powers that they have now, um, and some other notes for each of them and potential further reforms. So starting off with Scotland, how has devolution developed in Scotland? Um, so the Scottish Parliament was created by the Scotland Act of 1998, which gave the devolved body significant legislative and tax varying powers. And Scotland, because of its kind of um, significant independence movement because of its um, significant nationalism was given the most powers out of all of the devolved bodies and, and it still has the most powers out of all the devolved bodies. So that included control over most public services or health, education, justice um, and can be seen as service devolution which is a useful kind of phrase that you can use to describe it and so the way it was set up is the powers reserved for Westminster were listed such as defence, macroeconomic policy, uh, foreign policy, constitutional matters, and the, less, the rest of them were reserved for Scotland. Until 2007, Labour was in power, but from 2007, the SNP has been in power, um, either in minority, in coalition, um, or once in majority government as well, with Nicola Sturgeon, well, first Alex Salmon as the first minister um, for the SNP, but now Nicola Sturgeon, who's become a very key figure in UK politics. Another key thing that happened in relation to Scotland um, in, race, in the way that devolution developed was the 2014 Scottish Inde independence re referendum. Um, so there was an independence referendum so in Scotland in 2014. It led to a kind of surprisingly high support for independence at 45%. And in the run up to that, to kind of satisfy or kind of um, uh, try and prevent them going for independence, Scotland was given more powers and it's been given more powers since. Um, also to kind of reflect the calls for greater economy that can be seen in that independence referendum result. Um, and in particular, the Scotland Act of 2016, which gave the Scottish Parliament further powers, particularly in the area of tax raising. So they had the power to um, set all income tax rates and bans, which interestingly, they've recently used, um, as you'll see in the, in the notes later on. And this can now be seen as fiscal devolution. So Scotland now has a, a lot of powers. So looking at what, what power Scotland now, the Scottish Parliament now does have, um, it has power, the most power of all the devolved bodies. It controls key public services, including health and social policy, key welfare benefits, um, education, environment policy, law, home affairs, economic development. It also has significant fiscal powers, controlling income tax rates and bans, and the right to 50% of all VAT rates in Scotland. So now, on, like Holyrood raises about, so Holyrood is the Scottish Parliament, raises about 60% of the money that it spends. So using that power, the Scottish government recently increased the higher and top rates of income tax so that both rates are now 2% higher than the rest of the UK. So that shows how they're using their powers to create different policy um, that reflects the views of their voters um, in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. Um, and the Scottish Parliament also now has key constitutional powers. So it controls its own composition and electoral system. And since the Scottish Act Scotland Act of 2016, it can only be abolished with a referendum, making it a permanent part of the UK constitution. The 2016 Scotland Act also enshrined the Sewell Convention into law, um, meaning that Westminster has to ask Holyrood every time before legislating on a devolved matter such as health or education, and so it needs the consent um, of the Scottish Parliament. The final thing I've included just for Scotland is something that happened very recently in November 2022. So there was a really important Supreme Court ruling in 2022 um, in relation to another Scottish independence referendum. So it wasn't really clear who could legislate for an independence referendum in Scotland. Um, as parliamentary sovereignty, so that's the UK Parliament, is important, um, but often disputed in relation to Scotland, especially kind of in competition with popular sovereignty in Scotland. So what the, what the people want in Scotland, which obviously Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP were kind of really championing. Um, the first independence referendum was agreed um, or legislated by a special agreement between the Scottish 
government and the UK government and then passed by both parliaments to kind of um, give it legitimacy. Um, that hasn't been, there hasn't been agreement like that for the for a second referendum, a second independence referendum, with the UK government kind of saying no to one. Um, the Scottish government, however, tried to suggest that they could just hold one themselves um, despite that and sought to argue that they could legislate for a referendum themselves under the powers of the Scotland Act. What happened in November 2022 is that the UK Supreme Court ruled that the Scotland Act um, doesn't give the Scottish Parliament the power to unilaterally legislate for an independence referendum. Instead, it's still a reserve power of the UK Parliament, and therefore the, the consent of the UK Parliament is necessary. So Scotland can't, just, or the Scottish Government and Parliament can't legislate for a referendum on its own. So it kind of not only showed the power of the UK Supreme Court to clarify the powers of different devolved bodies, um, but also the continued validity of the power of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty and the fact that the kind of extent of constitutional control in Scotland shouldn't be overstated. In terms of potential future reforms of devolution in Scotland, there really aren't that many because it's got so many powers already. So it could be taken to Devo Max. Um, so that's the kind of maximum devolution that it can be taken to before you before you move to independence. So the maximum amount of powers. Um, and interestingly, a lot of polls suggest that if there was a second independence referendum, that Scottish people would vote to leave, um, to leave the UK. So it really is an interesting point in Scottish and UK politics, um, where there are really high calls for nationalism. The breakup of the UK could be, could definitely happen in the next, next few decades, not only from Scotland, but also from Northern Ireland, interestingly. Um, but obviously the more powers that are devolved to Scotland, the more pertinent the West Lothian question becomes. We're going to go through that on later in the video. Um, and also the kind of greater differences there are between Scotland and the rest of the UK, which can be problematic um, in terms of democracy. OK, so now moving on to Wales. So Wales started with far fewer powers than Scotland or Northern Ireland, as there was very little nationalist sentiment in Wales. And the 1997 referendum on Welsh devolution was very close. So there was a majority of just kind of 0.5%, so 50.5%, on just a 50% turnout. So pretty much only 25% support within the country for it, um, if you take into account the turnout. Um, at first, Wales was therefore only given um, the Welsh Assembly and had no legislative powers or first minister. So it was only granted administrative devolution. Over the years, however, Wales has gained a lot more powers in response to growing nationalism and public support for devolution. And that's particularly after the 2011 Welsh devolution referendum, which saw a 64% vote for primary legislative powers, and the 2017 Wales Act, which gave Wales further powers and renamed the Welsh Assembly the Welsh Parliament. Since 1997, Labour have always been in power um, in Wales, either on their own or in coalition. Mark Drakeford is the current First Minister. Um, you might know him from kind of gaining particular um, importance during COVID, as Wales diverged in some policies from the rest of the UK. So which powers does Wales now have? Especially since the 2017 Wales Act, the Welsh Parliament has gained a lot more powers, though it still has fewer powers than the Scottish Parliament and the Northern Irish Parliament. As with Scotland and Northern Ireland, the powers reserved for Westminster are now set out, with the Scottish Parliament able to legislate on the rest, um, on the rest, sorry, that should say the Welsh Parliament, with the Welsh Parliament able to legislate on the rest. So it can be seen as service devolution in the way that Scotland originally had. The Welsh Assembly now controls health and social services, education, the environment, housing, economic development, and its own composition and elections, among other things. And in terms of kind of fiscal powers, it co collects 10% of Wales' income tax and can vary the bands and rates for this 10%. It still doesn't control law and order, though, which contrasts um, with Scotland, including policing and legal jurisdiction, um, like the Scottish Parliament does, as I said. And that's because the UK government blocked it and, and effectively said no. Welsh independence is growing in popularity, with some polls over 30% um, support, and that may lead to greater um, devolution in Wales, with calls for Wales to have the same powers as Scotland currently has. Um, this also may have been influenced by the COVID period, in which you saw kind of Wales diverging from England and, and the rest of the UK significantly, and kind of demonstrating that it could do, do so effectively um, and successfully, especially at points doing so more successfully than England. So now moving on to Northern Ireland, devolution in Northern Ireland has developed pretty differently, in large part due to the specific context of Northern Ireland and the history of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. 
So it was introduced in 1998 as part of a broader peace process between Catholics and Protestants, um, so between nationalists and unionists, following the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. And power sharing was really key to this process, so power sharing between the two communities. Um, so the executive must be led by a first minister and deputy first minister, um, which have to be from different communities. Um, and several key decisions, including the budget and programme for government, require co cross-community support. So it kind of can't function without that cross-community support. And because of that, it often kind of hasn't functioned very well. So government in Stormont is very fragile, with frequent suspensions in which the parties refuse to work together in government. During these suspensions, government functions um, are, are kind of decided directly by the government in West Westminster. So it's effectively direct rule, um, during, which some, during which some significant changes have been made, including the legalisation of uh, same-sex marriage. The Norris Northern Irish government has been suspended since February 22, so it's currently suspended. Um, for the first time in May 2022, Sinn Féin became the largest party, but the DUP refused to nominate a speaker and form a government um, with the leader of the um, Sinn Féin, the Mich Michelle O'Neill, as first minister. So that's kind of why it's been shut down, because you need power sharing. If that power sharing isn't agreed to at a certain time, you don't have a government. So what powers does Northern Ireland now have? Um, in 1998, Northern Ireland was given, as Scotland was, primary legislative control over areas not reserved for Westminster, so in the same way that Wales has now. Apart from corporation tax and policing and justice being devolved, the North, Northern Irish Assembly hasn't really gained um, many more powers since, and it lacks, still lacks major tax raising powers. So like Wales, it now has service devolution and controls health and social services and kind of a lot of the similar areas of policy um, previously mentioned for Scotland and Wales. Um, and it can also legislate on some reserved matters with the support of the Northern Ireland Secretary. So the Northern Ireland Secretary is in the UK government. In terms of potential, fu potential future reforms, it's kind of unlikely because unionists are very opposed to, um, to further devolution. Um, a referendum on reunification with, with the Republic of Ireland is possible though, especially as it's now estimated that Catholics outnumber Protestants um, in Northern Ireland. So, Finally, moving on to England, which is which is quite different to the other three. So, how's devolution developed in England? Are there you kind of well, there actually you should um, see um, one of the local mayors mayors in England. That's Andy Burnham, who's kind of gained quite a lot of publicity and popularity during COVID. Um, unlike the other devolved bodies, England doesn't have a parliament, and devolution is England in England is defined by variation and inconsistency. So, certain powers were devolved to the Greater London Authority in nineteen ninety eight. In the rest of England, there's a kind of real patchwork of a great of arrangements, with many areas having no devolution and some areas having more than others. New Labour proposed regional assemblies in the early 2000s, um, which were pretty big um, areas, um, supposed to be pretty big areas of devolution within England. So, for example, the northeast, um, the southwest, that kind of thing. Um, but it was dropped after a 2004 referendum on a regional assembly in the northeast of England received a 78% no vote. So a pretty conclusive rejection by the electorate. Um, following that, the coalition and then the kind of conservative government under Cameron um, sought to promote the Northern Powerhouse, which is a key phrase of George Osborne, um, the Chancellor um, in the coalition, um, promoting transport links and greater investment. And kind of as part of that, they introduced city regions with metro mayors, including in Manchester, Sheffield and Liverpool, um, with, as I said, Land Labour's Andy Burnham being the most high profile. Only seven city regions have been created, um, while some have actually been kind of shut down with Hartlepool and Stoke scrapping them and returning to traditional local government. So which powers does England now have? I'm going to split this into um, looking at first London and then the other city regions. So that's a picture of Sadiq Khan up there, um, the current London mayor, and London has the most of all powers in England, controlled by a directly elected mayor and an elected London assembly. So London mayors are important political figures, um, so Sadiq Khan's the current one, before him you had Boris Johnson who obviously then became the Prime Minister, and Ken Levinston. The Great London Authority has, has strategic responsibility and power over policing, transport and economic development. So, of course, not as much as kind of Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, but considering that um, London has a massive population and is economically extremely important, that is still very important devolution. Um, and it's been able to kind of introduce some reforms because of that. For example, Kevin Livingston introduced the congestion charge uh, and free travel for young people, um, which had like very big impacts on people's lives in London. Um, city regions are modelled in ways, in many ways on London and intended to boost regional economies. So each city region has a kind of bespoke 
arrangement um, and power, and kind of negotiates those powers on a bespoke basis. So Greater Manchester kind of probably has the most out of any of the um, other city regions, and it's kind of blazed uh, a trail in gaining substantial control over health. Um, the, the focus of most deals in city regions on transport, infrastructure, and other areas linked to generating economic growth, such as um, education, business, business retention, skills, that kind of thing. Um, interestingly, the devolution of some healthcare policy to Greater Manchester has been linked to modest increases in life expectancy. So you see kind of some evidence of success, which I'm going to look through in a lot more detail um, just in, in a moment in the video. Um, these city region deals are less substantial devolution than to Scotland or Wales, um, and they're only administrative devolution. Um, so control over implementation rather than legislative devolution. They don't have their own parliaments. So the final thing to look at is the West Lothian question and English votes for English laws, which is another kind of, um, or was another type of devolution in England. So power being devolved to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland raised the West Lothian question. And that was kind of the question, like, it was questioned why Scottish MPs should be able to vote on English matters in the UK Parliament that don't affect their constituents, for example, on healthcare um, in England. Um, whilst English MPs can't do the same in the Scottish Parliament. And in order to tackle that, EVA was introduced in 2015. And that allowed English MPs to veto any legislation just affecting England from being passed. It didn't allow them to kind of make their own laws just for England, but they did get a veto on anything just affecting England. It wasn't used that often, so only in one third of bills in the 2015 to 2017 Parliament. Um, but it may have become more significant if a government was elected with a majority in the UK, but not in England, because that kind of England veto would have become a lot more important and used a lot more, um, especially kind of in a very um, in a very kind of political way. Um, but it was criticised for creating two tiers of MPs, adding unnecessary complications, and not providing a viable expression for English identity or kind of nationalism, and was scrapped by Boris Johnson's government in July 2021. But it's still on the syllabus, and you can definitely still introduce it um, because it is a quite important area of like potential reform, future reform if it could be reintroduced, and it's quite an important area where devolution was introduced. Okay, so I'm now going to go into some overall notes on devolution that you need to know. So rather than being specific to each country, um, so that's starting off with the Barnett formula. So this is pretty important, and the Barnett formula is the system used to determine the amount of funding given to each devolved body, so to Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. It was originally drawn up as a short-term mechanism in 1979 and doesn't take into account relative need. So, for example, Wales receives less money than Scotland despite being poorer, kind of less per head of the population, with England effectively subsidising the other three nations, which hits deprived uh, areas of England the hardest. So obviously England kind of is also slightly warped by the fact that London is the richer part of the UK, but there's some very deprived areas in England as well. Um, and they're really kind of hit quite hard by this because in the block grants um, that are given to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, that they get more per head of the population than England does, um, especially. So, for example, in um, 2021, public spending per person in the UK as a whole was £13,414 per person. And in England, it was 2% below that UK average. In Scotland, it was 11% above. In Wales, it's 6% um, above. And in Northern Ireland, it was 14% above. So neither Labour nor the Conservatives have sought to replace it, despite it kind of being quite an arbitrary mechanism, um, fearing political repercussions from voters in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And in the Scottish independence referendum, all three parties in Westminster pledged their support to continue it. On the other hand, Nigel Farage criticised it and argued it should be scrapped when he was leader of UKIP, as he saw it being unfair to the population of England. In terms of attitudes to devolution, there was kind of a, a kind of just kind of wave to in terms of support for devolution up until Boris Johnson. So since Tony Blair introduced devolution in 1997, all UK prime ministers have been supportive of it. With third, further devolution to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland under co under the coalition government and Conservative governments of Cameron and May, devolution continued to be seen as positive in terms of democracy um, and really key in keeping the union together. Um, in the face of growing nationalism, especially in Scotland with the 2014 independence referendum. Boris Johnson kind of really differed from this, um, describing devolution as a disaster and Tony Blair's biggest mistake in November 2020 and failing to work closely with devolved bodies um, when in power, with very frequent clashes with Scotland um, and Wales in particular um, over, COVID, over COVID policies 
and constant criticism of Nicola Sturgeon in particular. Liz Truss seemed to continue Boris Johnson's approach, obviously she wasn't in power for that long, so she really couldn't do much, um, but Rishi Sunak has sought to pull back from like, it somewhat since becoming um, Prime Minister, supporting a more cooperative approach, that's also difficult to see where he's going to go, because he hasn't been in power for that long. Um, COVID-19 was really kind of important for devolution, the development of devolution. In the early months of the, of the COVID pandemic, policy was very similar across all parts of the United Kingdom, with the Prime Minister and First Ministers of each devolved country um, all participating in joint, joint meetings up until early June. As time went on, however, policy really began to diverge, and there were tensions between the leaders of different parts of the UK. England and Northern Ireland, for example, lifted restrictions after the first lockdown quicker than Wales and Scotland, um, opening, for example, non-essential retail as well as pubs and restaurants. And other differences followed, especially in relation to um, education. At different points in the pandemic, different parts of the United Kingdom also had different levels of success in managing the spread of the virus. So COVID was really kind of a an kind of almost a science experiment where you really saw the differences in devolution. There was real scope for different um, for differences in policy in a way that people really felt in their lives that devolution was having a big impact. Um, so especially due to the nature of COVID being able to spread between populations of each devolved body, this led to increased tensions and criticisms. So Nicola Sturgeon, for example, criticised Boris Johnson for using the COVID crisis as a political weapon and repeating restrictions too quickly. Mark Drakeford, First Minister in Wales, accused Boris Johnson of disrespecting the people of Wales um, and called the PM really, really awful for neglecting the Welsh population in the way he formulated and announced COVID policies. And there was also criticism within England. So Andy Burnham, uh, Metro Mayor in Greater Manchester, very publicly criticised the UK government in October 2020, failing to provide sufficient financial support to businesses forced to shut down by government policies in the second lockdown. So he was there representing businesses in Greater Manchester. And COVID also led to devolved bodies becoming, um, the leaders of devolved bodies becoming household names and gaining notoriety due to public announcements and policy decisions that had a tangible, tangible impact on people's lives. So devolution itself became far more visible and high profile. So what I've got now is um, two useful examples of policy difference, two pretty detailed examples. So the first one is higher education. As education is an area of policy controlled by all de devolved bodies, higher education is a really useful example to show this policy difference. This is particularly um, as the Conservative Party has been in power in England, so a, a right-wing um, Brexit supporting government, um, whilst in, in the other devolved bodies there's more, been more left-wing um, governments, especially in Scotland and Wales. So in England, the coalition government increased tuition fees up to £9,250 per year for home students and scrapped most grants. So um, yeah, so £9,250 per year if you're an English student going to university. Um, that's what you have to pay, going to university in England. In Scotland, tuition fees for homeschool home students were scrapped in part by the um, Labour Lib Dem coalition government in 2001 and then completely by the SNP in 2008. So if you're a Scottish government, a Scottish student, sorry, going to a Scottish university, you don't pay any tuition fees. That's a really big difference in policy and really big impact, um, difference in impact on, on people's lives, which I'm sure a lot of you watching this video um, will kind of feel in, in, in a couple of years. In Wales, tuition fees for home students are capped at £9,000 per year, and there's a £1,000 grant to help with living costs for all students. So similar to, the, to England, but a bit more help. Um, a bit more kind of support, especially in terms of grants. Those grants were largely scrapped by England, um, have been scrapped by England. In Northern Ireland, by contrast, tuition fees are capped at £4,630 per year um, for home students. So pretty much you're paying half if you're from Northern Ireland and going to a Northern Irish university. So that really shows um, differences in policy and how devolution does have a big, big impact on people's lives. Health is an also a really useful example of policy difference. In terms of health policy, you can pick a number of things to look at. Um, but I've kind of decided to look at kind of prescription charges. So there's prescription charges in, in, in England, but not in the other devolved bodies. Um, in terms of um, financial support for the cost of um, the elderly, there's a lot more in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland than there is in, in England. Um, and Greater Manchester is also a really a useful example for this. So in 2015, the Greater Manchester city region um, was given devolved control over the health budget, um, which should be seen as administrative devolution with the implementation um, devolved rather than any um, legislative powers. 
So much of the health policy is similar to the rest of England, but there have also been changes. For example, they have a more joined up approach to care um, and greater funding for mental health care relative to other health care funding. So that's kind of a, a real example where you do see that policy difference and different impacts on people's lives um, because of devolution. OK, so now moving on to debates over devolution. And this is really where we're going to be getting into the analysis part of your essays. So real key arguments you can make in relation to devolution in, in terms of answering the essay questions that you can be asked. So prove, like so far, we've been looking at knowledge. Now we're really going into analysis. So in terms of de debates over devolution, first looking at the impact of devolution on democracy, then the impact of devolution on the unity of the UK, and then the impact of devolution on in terms of economic and policy impacts. And these are three kind of headings that you could use in an essay. So for example, you said you had an essay, evaluate the argument that devolution has been a success. You do the first paragraph on democracy, second paragraph on unity of the UK, third paragraph on economic and policy impacts, with for and against arguments in each and an evaluation in each. And then at the end, in your conclusion, come into an overall judgment in relation to the question, which obviously you should have in your introduction as well. Um, so starting with the impact of devolution on democracy. So the arguments that devolution has had a positive impact to democracy is that devolution has allowed for more effective representation, with devolved bodies being able to respond to the concerns of their electorates. So that can be seen in the differences in policy in the areas of COVID, education, healthcare that um, just went through. The more proportional electoral systems um, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, so that's AMS and STV, have led to a more representative mix of parties as well. And the UK Parliament still theor theoretically has the power to remove the powers of the devolved bodies and is therefore still theoretically sovereign. So UK parliamentary sovereignty can be seen as a kind of key part of democracy in the UK, and it still can be said to be sovereign. On the other hand, um, some argue that parliamentary sovereignty um, has actually been undone uh, and undermined by devolution, by moving decision-making power away from the UK Parliament, which is elected by the whole of the UK. Further, turnout in devolved assembly elections is generally low. Um, so 63.5% in the 2021 Scottish Parliament elections, um, around the same in the 2022 Northern Irish Assembly elections, but just 46.6% in the 2021 Senate, so that's the Welsh um, Parliament elections. So it can be argued also that devolution undermines equal citizenship um, in the UK, as divergences in policy uh, mean that different citizens have different access to healthcare, education, etc., and are subject to different laws. Fiscal devolution can also be argued to undermine redistribution of resources from richer to poorer areas, whilst the Barnett formula can be seen as unfair and undemocratic. So they're the arguments on either side in terms of democracy. And as I said at the start of the video, you can download um, the PDF that you should be seeing up there on the Politics Explained website to kind of look those, through those in a bit more detail. In terms of the impact of devolution on the unity of the UK, the arguments that devolution has had a positive impact on the unity of the UK is that no nationalist movement has yet achieved independence, and it can be argued that devolution has satisfied some demands for self-government and therefore helped to avoid the breakup of the UK. Devolution has also led to a relatively stable peace in Northern Ireland, providing the framework for building long-term change away from um, what came before in terms of the, the conflict with the Troubles. And recent increase in support for independence can partly be attributed to the unpopularity of the Conservative government in the UK, rather than due to devolution itself. In terms of arguments that devolution has had a negative impact on the unity of the UK, the asymmetric nature of devolution, so different powers for different parts of the UK, um, can be seen as undermining the unity of the UK as different citizens have different levels of representation and are subject to different laws and different policies. It can also be argued that devolution has fueled increased nationalism and calls for independence by showing the ability of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to govern themselves and giving nationalist parties and politicians a platform. So the SNP has been in power in Scotland since 2007 and almost achieved independence in 2014. Since then, um, support among the Scottish population for independence has increased, with polls now suggesting there is a majority support for independence. You also see support for Welsh independence growing. Um, and in Northern Ireland, the more radical Sinn Féin has became the largest party in the nationalist bloc um, and was the largest pol party following the 2022 Northern Irish Assembly elections. Um, and especially more recently, uh, relations between devolved bodies and leaders um, and the UK government have been very strained and fragmented with tensions and a lack of cooperation. So that can be really seen as undermining the unity of the UK. And that was especially seen during COVID. Finally, looking at the economic and policy impacts of devolution. So on the one hand, the arguments that devolution has had a positive economic and policy impact. Firstly, the scope for experimentation means that some policies, such as the ban on smoking in public spaces, 
um, have been tried in Scotland and other devolved bodies and then ad adopted across the whole of the UK. So it can have those kind of positive um, policy impacts in terms of experimentation. Devolution has also allowed for policy that reflects the interests of local populations um, and can be seen and can be seen in the policy divergences over COVID, healthcare and education. Um, so, for example, as I said, the Scottish government recently increased the higher and top rates of income tax um, so that both rates are now 2% higher than in the rest of the UK. In some areas, more effective policy making can also be seen as the result of devolution. For example, in Greater Manchester, greater control over health has correlated with modest increases in life expectancy in some cases. On the other hand, arguments that devolution has a negative impact um, in terms of economics and policy there hasn't really been that much devolution dividend in terms of economic and policy improvements, um, with devolved bodies even falling behind in some areas and generally just being similar to England. Um, Scottish education, for example, has been drastically changed by the SNP, but Scotland has since fallen behind England in the PISA rankings, so the Programme for International Student Assessment, which kind of measures the success of different, um, different education systems in the world. It can be argued that devolution undermines equal citizenship, as I kind of mentioned also in the democracy um, part, as divergence in policy mean that different systems have different access to different healthcare, education, etc., and are subject to different laws. So that can be seen as a real negative in terms of um, economics and policy. And some argue that devolved bodies, particularly the SNP, focus too much on independence rather than day-to-day -day policy making. Okay, the final thing I'm going to touch on in this video is potential further reforms to devolution. So that's both to existing devolved bodies and the potential creation of devolved bodies, particularly in England. So in terms of um, arguments about further devolution to existing devolved bodies, arguments for further devolution to existing devolved bodies include that devolved bodies have shown that they can run public services and decide policy effectively, especially during the COVID crisis. Brexit allows a lot of policy areas that used to be governed by the UK, by the EU, sorry, to be given to devolved bodies, um, including in already devolved areas such as agriculture and energy. Though Wales is smaller than Scotland and more closely integrated with England, there's no reason why Cardiff shouldn't be given um, many of the powers that Holyrood in Scotland already enjoys. There is also significant scope for more fiscal devolution, particularly to Wales, Northern Ireland and city regions in England. Further, devolution, well further devolution, may also discourage Scotland from voting for independence. In terms of arguments against um, further devolution to existing devolved bodies, further devolution, especially in terms of tax raising powers, risks leading to greater disparities in the public services offered to different UK citizens, um, and therefore further undermines UK or risks further undermining equal citizenship, um, whilst also reducing burden sharing between richer and poorer regions in the UK. Further, um, another point is that devolved bodies already hold significant amounts of power. And there's not really much public support for that increasing. Um, whilst there, you can also argue that devolved bodies haven't really proved that they can really, that the, the benefits of devolution are that high in terms of kind of economic and political benefits. And finally, um, many areas of regulation, such as food and safety standards and environmental targets, arguably better protect people if they're national, um, or if they're national policies, um, and also limit the burden on businesses. In terms of further devolution to England, I'm going to first look at some overall arguments and then look at kind of specific possible policies. So, um, in terms of overall arguments for further devolution to England, devolution is currently asymmetric, with England underrepresented within the context of the whole of the UK. Um, and this is especially important as it holds the majority of the UK's population. Further devolution to England could help solve the West Lothian question and give an outlet for nationalism. Um, within England and therefore present it being used and manifested in divisive ways, such as it's been argued that happened during the 2016 Brexit referendum. In terms of arguments against further devolution to England, it can be argued that none of the proposed methods for representing England are practical, um, and they're the ones we're going to look at in a moment. Um, there's also little public appetite for further devolution to England, and other measures could be taken to better represent the English population instead of further devolution. So they could include kind of um, reintroducing and adapting English votes for English laws and scrapping the Barnet formula, for example. In terms of um, further reforms to England, one of the key ones, suggested ones, is an English parliament. So arguments for an English parliament are that it would complete devolution with the UK, making it symmetrical and granting the English population the same level of representation that the rest of the UK has. 
It would also create a more coherent system of devolution with the federal UK parliament responsible for UK wide issues and then each um, part of the UK having its own um, having its own parliament to control issues that only pertain to that specific country. Um, it would also give English identity and interests effective political and institutional expression and could be combined with the codification of the constitution to establish clear relations between the UK government and the government of the four nations. On the other hand, in terms of arguments against an English parliament, an English parliament would only serve to create another layer of government and would create tensions between the English parliament and um, English parliament and English government um, and between them and the UK wide government, with the former challenging the latter. It wouldn't create a coherent or equal system as England is much bigger than Scotland, um, Wales and Northern Ireland and holds 85% of the UK's population. Um, further, federalism arguably works best when there is no dominant state or region. There's also no real support for an English parliament within England, um, and arguments between London and the component nations over funding and policies really wouldn't go away. Um, also, it can be argued that some of those proposing a federal Britain and English parliament, perhaps just using it, um, uh, using the issue to secure a codified constitution, which is what they really want, rather than seeing it as a desirable goal in itself. A final proposed reform to devolution in England is further regional devolution in England. So that's in terms of city regions um, and regional assemblies, rather than kind of devolution to the whole of England. So on the one hand, it can be argued that more city regions or regional assemblies would bring decision making would bring decision making closer to the people and address the different interests of each English region. As many consider England too large to have its own parliament, regional assemblies would also create a more balanced devolution assessment within the UK. While some areas such as Cornwall and Yorkshire have a strong sense of regional identity, and therefore it can be seen that kind of regional devolution in those areas would really work. On the other hand, it can be argued that it would break up England and fail to provide expression or a platform for English interests um, and identity, whilst few areas have a strong sense of regional identity in the same way that kind of Cornwall or Yorkshire do. There's also potential for tensions between regional assemblies or city regions and local government. And then the final two things is that urban interests would often dominate regional assemblies and drown out rural interests, whilst there's also little public support for a further regional layer of government in England, as shown by the 2004 referendum um, on introducing a regional assembly in the northeast of England, um, which received a 78% no vote. So yeah, that's everything um, for devolution. As I mentioned at the start of the video, in terms of the kind of um, potential essay questions you could be asked, the kind of first topic is on whether the impact of devolution, so whether it's been a success, and the second one's on potential further reforms to devolution. So if you cover those two topics and have kind of essay plans and ideas for how to answer those two questions, you should be in pretty good stead. As I mentioned at the start of the video, the PDF you've seen up here throughout the video um, is in the first link in the description on the Politics Explained website, where you can also find um, lots of essay plans, um, and other resources that can help you in your A-level politics, and um, also a, a place to sign up for tutoring with me if that's something you'd be interested in. So yeah, um, thanks for watching the video. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions, and make sure to subscribe so you see any future videos, um, as I'm going to keep releasing ones on uh, content in the lead up to the exams this year. Thank you.